All right, hi ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we've been doing something special recently. We've been doing an event called Invertober, and this has been a lot of fun. We've been live streaming every single night. Um, we've been doing things like sketching directly from my microscope, doing ink outlines twice a week, spreading death's head moths, seeing live critters like my tarantulas and tomorrow we're actually going to be seeing a scorpion um so that's going to be a lot of fun yesterday we did have a little bit of an issue with um connecting to youtube um so today i am starting just a couple minutes early about 15 minutes early um and so when it gets to 10 o'clock we will be switching over to sketching on the microscope i pulled out a tiger beetle for us it's cisandella sexcutata it's um one of the tiger beetles that is metallic green and blue and i thought it'd be a lot of fun to check out with you guys today but because we're starting a little bit early i thought we would um spread at least one we'll just spread one death head moth while we're waiting for everybody to join and that way um and this is oops. and this is good because now i know that our live stream is going to work and i don't have to worry about um like yesterday we started about 30 minutes late because i spent that time trying to figure out how to get connected i need to make sure that my phone is off <laughs> that's silly people keep messaging me Very good. That'll be better. So we are taking this death's head moth out of its envelope. I believe, yeah, unfortunately, this one lost a leg during the, uh, during the, uh, um, process of relaxation. It may have come without this leg, but these legs are not super important to the display factor on death's heads because, as you see, the legs are underneath. And so a lot of times people don't even see the legs. So it's kind of almost okay if one drops off. I've got a little envelope of legs that have fallen off. There's only a handful, maybe about three or four of them. All right, so this is a glassine envelope. It is a butterfly and a moth envelope. So um, that's the envelope that this moth has come out of, and it doesn't wipe the scales off of its wings. So um, after I take the moth out of the envelope, I'm actually going to open it up. The envelope is still just a little bit wet from being in the relaxation chamber, but that's all right. It's going to dry too as we are spreading our moth. And I always cut the edges off so that we have one flat um, rectangle without any of those seams. Because sometimes those seams um, get in the way. Susan, ooh, yes, iridescence. Yes, I'm pretty excited about it. The tiger beetle is absolutely gorgeous. Yes, you are exactly right, Susan. These death's head moths are for um, are used for decoration. They're actually gonna be um, they're actually gonna be sold at one of my friend's shops here in Philadelphia, and um, we're spreading them because Halloween is coming up, right? So um, <clears throat> that is what they're being used for, and that's also why we're not putting pins directly through the center of their bodies. I'm going to be taking pins and surrounding her body so that there isn't a pin that even goes through the center. Um, I believe these specimens are essentially going to be hot glued into display cases. Um, but I am doing the, I'm doing the spreading for him, which is actually kind of cool because I get to show you ladies and gentlemen, um, how I, how I do this. And so we have a homemade spreading board here. It's just two pieces of styrofoam. One um, I took a heat knife to actually yesterday, um, and we built this one. Good morning, Chaos. So it's actually Monday morning where you are, right? Sorry about the Sunday-Monday confusion. Uh, 
All right, so I am just getting the body into this channel here. I'm crossing um, two uh, pins kind of over the body here and helping kind of force that body down into the channel. And then I'm going to take two and kind of bring this abdomen down also. And so they'll both be sitting in the channel. And at least in this specimen, that's kind of cool, our... Um, our specimen, uh, when the when the body went down into the channel, the wings actually came and opened up for us. Thank you, wings. Here we go. Make sure that these can get over that edge. Perfect. Sorry, Susan, every now and again, the YouTube chat will hold a comment because we're talking about insect butts, abdomens. So um, Susan said, did you make a bigger channel for their huge abdomens? Yes, I did. I had to make a fairly large channel, except like the first time I thought I made it really big and then it wasn't big enough. And so I ended up going back in and deepening and lengthening the channel to be almost a half an inch. Actually, yeah, a half an inch wide and a half an inch deep, deep for these for these um, moth abdomens. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take this wing using my forceps and pull it up. Oh no, I put these too close. We're just gonna put it off to the side for now. We have about five minutes to get this moth spread and on the board so that we can start our normally scheduled sketch at 10. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece here and... I'm going to hold down, and then I can take pins and go all the way around the wing. And I think that this one might actually have to go a little bit higher, but I want to get the wing at least open and spread, and then once the other one comes up, you know what? That might be pretty close. That might be pretty close. All right, so instead of putting pins on this side, I'm just going to kind of set it here so that it's here where I need it, but it's not going to interfere with the pins. I'm coming in. So this is going to tag our wing down so that we can make sure that there's this horizontal line here. If you've been around when we've, um, when we've spread these moths before, you know that I have a line here. And it's directly horizontal, so as long as I line my abdomen straight up and down, this will tell me if my wings are lined up. So it looks like my left one is actually pretty good and my right one has to come down just a little bit. But like I've said, but um, like I've said before when we are spreading moth wings, it's easier to let it come down naturally just a little bit than it is to um, go back in and pull it up. So if I just let a little bit if I just let it go a little bit, it will bounce down naturally. There we go. Did I let it go too far? Yeah. That's 
good. So now I'm going to pin all the way around these wings. pulling the hind wings up too so I put I left a pin here and I don't need that one there that should hold that wing so we'll get rid of this line for a moment abdomen was censored yes I don't know why you need to prepare dough for bread, um, for baking bread now. Oh, cool. Yeah, because you work at, a, because you work at, um, you make bread. That's very cool. Chaos, you should make a moss-shaped loaf of bread. Oh, that would be fun. How's your wound from the pin yesterday? Oh, um, my wound from the pin yesterday is pretty good. Um, it didn't, it didn't get me too bad, so... All right, we've got one hind wing up. Bakery, yes, bakery. I'm like, you work at one of those places where they make breads and cakes and um, cupcakes, and I couldn't think of... I don't know why. I couldn't think of the word bakery. Well, that's because it's not a bug word. And right now, um, all of the bug words are running through my head. <laughs> uh, it's funny. All right. So, um, we've got both of these hind wings spread. It is 1959. So we have 90 or, um, about 60 seconds left to finish this guy. And I think it should be pretty easy. I want to align this abdomen to make sure that my abdomen is going to be straight. You can see it's kind of curving off to the side a little bit. And I want to fix that. Um, so I'm going to be taking these two that are crossing over the abdomen. I see this leg here on the side, and a lot of times when I see the legs here on the side, I want to take them and put them into the channel. So this is my dissecting probe. There. It needed to, need to kind of get tucked underneath the abdomen. All right. So we've got that, and now I'm going to see if I can get this abdomen to curve straight. Nope, it's not going to curve straight. So instead, I will cross underneath it. These moths do tend to, because their abdomens are so large, they tend to be pretty heavy, and they kind of sink down into the tray. So it's better after you've secured it around the sides to put the pins actually underneath the abdomens rather than on top. Um, then I'm going to come up here and pull up these antenna. And I find as long as the antenna are up and mostly parallel with the angle of the, of the front wings, then they look really nice when they are taken down. Um, we will be going ahead and taking down these death heads too at some point, so that's fun. All right, that is the one that we did on Facebook, the one that we did on YouTube last night, and the one we did this morning. I'm going to comb, you're going to laugh at me a little bit, but I think I might take a pin and kind of comb these hairs down. There. Now it looks more like a skull. Did I get any cool moth-based superpowers? I wish. 
And I feel like if you were talking about moth-based superpowers, um, your superpower would probably be smelling, would be scent, because some males can smell the ladies from, like, over a mile away with those huge antenna. So I feel like if you got poked by a pin while spreading and you were going to gain a moth ability, it would definitely be... Um, it would, like, be big, floofy antenna and um, the ability to smell really, really well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, check out what we have here. This is a tiger beetle. I am looking for my sketchbook. It should be right here somewhere. Aha. Uh -huh. I went and put the moths on top of it. That's so funny. All right, changing gears, getting these pins out of the way, cleaning up my desk a little bit. So I've got some elbow room, elbow room. Got to, got to get you some elbow room. Bonus points for if you know what um, musical that song is from. All right, so... Oh no, you got pinned. Yeah, unfortunately. I work in one of the oldest bakeries in your area or in Germany. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> Susan goes, oh, I was wondering why the skull pattern was crooked. Yeah, the skull pattern was crooked because the hairs were crooked. And I was looking at it thinking, I could leave it natural, right? I could just leave, have left that pattern kind of sideways. But it looks better straight. And I think that the pers the people who are purchasing them will be happy that, the, that it is, is straight and more even looking. You think that you have these guys in at the Albany Pine Bush? Yes, for sure. Um, definitely in Albany, you have many, many tiger beetles. Um, tiger beetles are in the subfamily that we call Cicindelini. All right, so tiger beetles actually, when I was first learning in school, I learned them as a as their own family, that they were Cicindella D. Um, but then, uh, about halfway through my schooling, all my pre professors changed their minds. There must have been a new paper that came out or something. And it took the Cicindellids, that whole family of tiger beetles, and made it a subfamily of ground beetles. So, ground beetle is kind of the umbrella term. We've seen a number of ground beetles, um, carabids a lot of times we call them, um, where tire beetles are a type of ground beetle, all right? And so they're at Cicindelini, which is a subfamily. Um, in insect taxonomy, subfamilies always end in I-N-A-E. Um, and families always end in I-D-A-E. Um, if you are going down, um, in insects, you go family, subfamily, and then a lot of times you have something called a tribe. Um, a tribes end in I-N-I, and then you go genus, species. So that's a little bit of taxonomy. I know that you ladies and gentlemen like to learn about taxonomy every now and again. Um, so, oops. We're going to get rid of that word and bring this word in. Yay. All right. So we're going to be looking at a tiger beetle. Its species is Cicindella sexcutata. And if I take a book or something and put it underneath this, then you'll be able to see it even closer. Maybe we'll be able to get another thing. Let's see. What else can we stack underneath our, our friend to get it closer to the camera? It's like a game. There we go. Awesome. So this is Cicindella sexcutata, and if we are looking at its elytra, so those that hard outer shell, those wings over the abdomen, um, let's get out. Where's Terry? There's Terry. Okay, so. 
we have six spots here. One, two, three on this side, and then one, two, three white spots on that side. And that's actually where they get their name, Sex Gutata. Sex um, is not mean anything with genders. That is actually the word for six. And gutata is the word that me is um, rooted in a word that means kind of like droplet. A lot of times when you're talking gutata or gutatis, you're talking about like a water droplet shape or like a droplet of paint. Um, in this one, I assume that when somebody was naming this, they thought that those six spots looked like that someone ta had taken a paintbrush and put six little paint droplets on the back of their elytra. And that is what, um, and that's what you're looking at there. And also acoustic camouflage and super speed, if you consider their superpower um, then super smelling. I guess that's true. So acoustic camouflage chaos for, um, for moths. If you are doing like, uh, Luna moths and their tails, that's pretty cool. Or, um, I don't know about super speed. How fast can moths really, I mean, some of them can fly pretty quickly, but a lot of moths, um, fly more like, I imagine more like owls, like they're really kind of slow and um, steady. Scary eye spots. I love it. All right. So we're going to be taking our friend here. We're going to be putting it under the microscope. But while it's here, we might as well get a decent measurement of it. Tiger beetles have very, very fragile legs, so I have to be really careful with it. Um, regularly, legs and antenna fall off in these specimens. So it looks like our specimen, if we were measuring from the back of the abdomen to the front of the head... It looks like I would say it's about 1.2, 1.25, somewhere between the 1.2 and 1.3 mark on the length of this specimen. Oh, and if you want, make sure you get a screenshot of the overall body shape because the microscope does not have the ability to see the entire body at the same time. All right. So, our tiger beetle is fast. If you want to talk about speed, if you want to talk about speed, the tiger beetle is really what you want to talk about. Um, I'm not sure if I remember all of the very specific numbers on, like, their exact speeds, but they are incredibly, incredibly fast. I believe one of the fastest animals on the planet when you compare them to body size. Um, so if you were doing, me instead of meters per second, you are doing, like, body lengths per second. Um, I believe they're the fastest running, one of the fastest running organisms on the planet. Um, and they run so fast that they can't see while they're running. So um, they're, the world around them turns into kind of like if you were a, uh, a sp in a spacecraft and you went, went into hyperdrive and all of the stars went shh like around you so that you couldn't see anything in particular. That's how tiger beetles see when they're running. Everything just turns into a blur because they run so fast that their brain cannot comprehend the world around them while they're running. So they actually depend on their antenna to make sure that they don't run into things. So the common name of this um, tiger, tiger beetle is the six-spotted tiger beetle. Now, 
many insects, when you get down to species, the individual species don't have a common name. But tiger beetles regularly do. Tiger beetles will regularly have their own common names. And I think that that's, uh, that has a couple of reasons. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is that they are really pretty. <laughs> Um, so people notice them. They're brightly colored. Um, they're regularly taken pictures of, and I believe that when things are really pretty, people are more likely to pay attention to their differences and to be able to kind of spot, ident identify them down to species. Um, another insect that regularly has, um, species level um, common names would be dragonflies or butterflies. Those animals that people are like looking for when they're going out and about a lot of times have common names that go down to species. But if you were talking about like rove beetles, there are thousands of species of rove beetles and there are only a handful of rove beetles that have their own common names. So, yeah, unfortunately, I guess the moral of the story, Susan, is that ugly bugs don't generally get all of the love, and they don't really get noticed as regularly either. A hundred body lengths per second would... It, that, sounds, that sounds about right. Um, I admittedly, I would have to look it up on Google. Beauty is subjective, um, but when you are, beauty is subjective, and, not but, um, and uh, when things are generally more colorful, they get noticed by more people. It's just kind of how the world works sometimes. So we're going to, oops, I bumped my specimen. Come on back, come on back. All right, this is as far as I can zoom out on the microscope, and that actually doesn't look too bad, so we're going to get it into focus, and we'll be able to see, actually, most of our body under the microscope. Okay. I'm pretty happy with that, and actually, because we can see it, I'm curious how accurate my reading was. At, we had mentioned somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3. Look at that, 1.24 centimeters. We were so close. I said 1.25. <laughs> All right. So I hope that everyone who wanted to be here today is going to get here easily, and I'm so happy that we didn't have any problems getting onto the live stream. Things are doing well. I guess that's true. Tiger beetles are also, st they generally stand out in the open. They also are an insect that is looking for a kind of sandy substrate, sandy soil. So they're not going to be digging and spending a lot of time underneath it. They're going to be kind of running along the top of that. Um, so that also could be the case. Cool. Yeah, the fact that they're out in the open, like dragonflies are out in the open and butterflies are easily seen and out in the open. All right. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to get an idea of how um, how large my tiger beetle is going to have to be because you also have to keep in mind these legs are really, really long, and I want to see if I can keep all of the legs on the piece of paper. Um, that means kind of starting off with really long, really long legs. So then maybe, I'm just trying to give myself, I'm giving myself really light lines on my paper to give myself an idea. I'm trying to guess, estimate the, uh, the body length. Something like this. That should be fine. All right, so I, um, I'm going to make sure my body stays actually pretty small because I want to get all of these legs in. So we're going to bump my paper up just a little bit. I'm going to start with sketching this head up here. And so 
I want to get an easy outline um, that stays nice and light, first of all, uh, before we before we zoom in. Oops, I bumped you. Um, before we zoom in. So I'm going to make sure I keep this kind of light. Our head connects to the pronotum right here at a very much a horizontal line. And then let's see. I'm imagining what the head looks like without the protrusion of the eyes. So I'm going to pull it up kind of like this and then bring it back down. Um, our eyes are going to be kind of kidney bean shaped. Um, so they're inverted in the center and then they're going to come out away from the head. That's kind of just a basic estimate. We're going to be coming back and adding a lot more detail when we zoom in. Um, and then after that front of the head, we are going to have mandibles. And these mandibles come up the front kind of like this. Tiger beetles have very large mandibles. They are predatory. Um, and then you're going to have this kind of rectangle up here in the front. That's the, um, that's the labrum or the upper lip of the head of my beetle. So we've got the head, the compound eyes, the mandibles, the labrum, and our antenna are also going to be coming off of the front here. Um, so I'm just going to give myself a light outline as to about where I think that they're going to go and about how long they need to be. I want to keep, I, admittedly, I always want to try and keep my antenna out of the words, but regularly it doesn't work, and then my antenna end up in the middle of the word. Um, and you know what? We're just going to let it happen, I guess. Because when I come back and I do it, no, I don't want to. We'll see what happens. Maybe I will, maybe I'll pull it down a little bit further or maybe I'll make them come back pull back like this both of them all right after looking at a whole bunch of angles I'm gonna pull my antenna down in this direction so that they don't um, so that they don't mess with my uh, my words up there and those are really, really light, so I'm going to have the ability to erase them when we zoom in and get all those details in. Um, it's all dunes from the last ice age. Susan, that is so cool. So yes, you will have us you will have a lot of tiger beetles in places that have lots of sandy spaces. Um, and if you look in the sandy areas where you also have a little bit of moisture, a little bit of water, it's just enough so that the sand um, just enough so that the the sand can hold a shape, like hold a tube. You'll notice these small holes in the sand. So it kind of looks like this. There's a little hole in the ground, and then you have this tube. And this tube um, is where the baby, uh, the baby tiger beetles will live. And they have this really cool adaptation where their head is flat and disc-shaped, and then their body is like this and it has this spine and this mouth is over here um so he, they have this weird body shape um as mag as grubs where they have this flat head that kind of caps the top of their hole and then their uh, their um, abdomen has this spine that kind of pokes into the side of the sand so that they can hold themselves up and then when an insect tries and walks over they'll lift their cap up and they eat um, so they're predatory on any of the small insects that are crawling around on the sand. And um, if you walk by and you scare them, they can disconnect themselves from here and they drop down into their burrow. And their burrow can be very deep. Their burrow can be a foot or two foot deep, um, depending on what species you're working with. So that's a little fun story about their grubs, their immature stage. Have you guys watched the Lewis and Clark TV series? I have not watched the Lewis and Clark TV series. Um, what live stream, what service it is it on? Because I'm actually looking for a, um, I'm actually looking for something new to watch. 
and I have most <laughs> I have most live stream pro um, apps. All right, so we have our head kind of lightly sketched out. This is our pronotum, this kind of thin neck-like area. This is where our first pair of legs are connected. And then once you move past that, you're going to have the little triangle here. That's your scutellum. And then you have shoulders, and you have the elytra, or the wings. Don't need that anymore. So we're coming in this way. And it looks like at the very end of the elytra, instead of meeting really even and um, even and rounded, it kind of comes down to this point down here. And I believe that is the end of the abdomen. So the elytra um, actually continue this way. So it's kind of like this where the abdomen sticks out a little bit after the elytra. Um, we are going to be able to zoom in on that when we're finalizing this here. But... That's about what my light sketch is going to look like. I'm going to give him, let's see, I'm going to give him some stick leg arms. So coming out here from the pronotum, coming all the way up here, and then it looks like my tarsal segments will conveniently fit in between the words. That makes me happy. All right, for my um, middle legs, we're going to be taking them up a little bit and then coming back down, I believe, yeah. We're going to be coming up, coming back down, and then our tarsal segments are going to come out this way. And then for our hind leg, it's going to have to go over the middle leg and come back down. But that's all right. And maybe I'm going to try to keep the, um, the tarsal segments parallel to one another. So if this one is coming down at this kind of angle, I'm going to try and keep these ones at the same angle. That should make it look kind of neat. Or I could make them come down this way so they're, this will be better. I'm going to make it come down straight, completely vertical, so that when I, if and when I do the other side, they will also come down straight together. So it's okay to make your first sketch a little bit messy. I find that the more practice I get at these first sketches, the messier my first sketches become. Because I know that there's no fear in the fact that I might, I'm going to have to erase a lot of these lines anyway. So it's okay to make them a little scribbly. Um, and because you're always coming back to fix them and make them better. Um, So I'm just kind of evening out these third legs. I know that regularly I don't finish both pair of legs, but um, when I give them at least the stick figures, then when I'm coming back with pen, I feel like I feel more prepared to do the outlines on the legs if I have those there. So... You get antlion holes in the sand. That is awesome. What time of year do the tiger beetles holes come around? <laughs> All right, so I would say probably spring, but you probably could find tiger beetle holes year round because some tiger beetles spend the whole year as a grub. Um, some of them take more than a year to become an adult, so I bet you you could find them year-round. They're probably most common, though, in the spring. Um, admittedly, here's the thing, I know that they exist, but I have never seen them myself. So they are very, very small pinhole-shaped holes, but I do know people that... Oh, when did that happen? Our beetle lost his toes. Darn it. We'll have to look at a middle or a hind pair of legs when we are uh, talking about the front legs so that we can see all of its tarsal segments.
My girlfriend suggested to watch that in our anniversary. I want to know if it's a cheesy show. Oh, that's funny. No, I have no idea because I, um, because I've never seen it either. Ha 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 Oh, that's funny. The Doctor Who with the Giant Spiders. I need to watch, um, rewatch Doctor Who. I think that that would be a lot of fun. It's one of those shows that I started and really enjoyed but never finished it. I love picking apart insect videos, and you're like, that's not right, or this isn't right, um, or looking at things and talking about what is correct. Um, I always thought that, you know, even though A Bug's Life is a Disney movie, I loved that some of the stuff in it was pretty accurate. So I just tried to move our specimen over a little bit, straighten it up. I'm going to zoom in on it so that we can see. Yes, that's what I wanted. So you can see the metallic greens and blues on this six-spotted tiger beetle. But you also can see some of that... Um, you can see some of the texturing on the exoskeleton. Um, I believe you would just call those ridges. Um, they're not straight. A lot of times when we say striations, they're straight. Um, I think they would just be called ridges. But they almost looks like, to me, I've always thought it looked like somebody took their fingerprint and put it on the head of a tiger beetle. All right, before you get on to the head, sorry, at the end... At the back end, are the last pair of spots on the elytra, or is the abdomen protruding beyond the elytra? The last spots are on the elytra. The last spots are on the elytra, and the abdomen is protruding um, past those. So if we look right here, there's those spots. They are on the elytra. And if I focus it, you see how there's, it's not a huge, it's not huge. So actually I think mine might have been too large. But there's the little tip of the abdomen at the end, right after those spots. It's not huge, but it is noticeable and I think is going to likely be one of those characteristics that shows up on a key as to whether or not the abdomen protrudes from the elytra. Um, and this specimen here, its wings are just a little slightly open, but a lot of times they are closed all the way. And when we zoom in, we can see that there might actually be eight spots because there's a little white one here and another little itty bitty white one there. So there are six large white spots, but we've got two little itty bitty spots also um, that I guess we could only see when we're looking at it on a microscope. Now let's get this head back in focus. All right, so I think with my head, it's going to need a little bit, um, it's going to need a little bit of help with the shaping. Um, I'm pretty happy with the eyes other than they're going to have to come in just a little bit. Let's see. I'm going to start my head where do I want to start my head? I think I'm going to start with the two um, vertical lines that come down from the eyes. Because I know about how wide I want my head. So that's going to be a pretty easy place to start. Um, the where, it, where the head crosses and connects to the pronotum, it's not all the way a straight line. So where I have a straight line here, I am going to make it wave just a little bit so it comes up and goes back down. All right, and that little bit of a wave, make sure that the front, it, the, the highest point of the wave is also going to stay the center of your head. So it looks like I might be, there we go, that'll help just a little bit. 
I might be recentering my beetle because that line doesn't seem to line up with my elytra. But that'll be fine as we move down. We'll fix it. All right. Now we have our eyes. Um, I have this eye went down here at the bottom. I have it more pointed and this is going to be kind of rounded. So I'm taking the end of this eye and rounding it out and then bringing it up because that end of that little bit of the, uh, of the exoskeleton, it comes up into the eye just a little bit. And then out. And our compound eye, make sure that it protrudes out past the edge of where our head was so that it looks like it's coming out just a little bit. That's going to help our friends see. And then we're going to do the same thing on the other side. Keep in mind that we want to that we want to try and keep our specimen here symmetrical. I think I'm closing in on this eye finished up here. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Alright, so we've got our compound eye taken care of. If you wanted, I think you probably had enough time to get some of these, um, some of these, uh, ridges on the exoskeleton sketched in if you'd like. Um, they do run kind of like in this direction. They run kind of front to back. All right. Um, I do want to, we're going to be changing the angle of our specimen so that we have a better look at the mandibles. I want to draw the mandibles like they are um, up rather than kind of going down like this. Plus, if I angle our specimen a little bit, we'll be able to see more of the mouth parts. You know what we're going to do actually? We're going to look at our specimen head on. Because I can't help it. Check out those mandibles. That's wicked. So that yellow piece, all right, so this is what we're looking at. This is the edge of the head here where you can see the metallic green blue ends. That's the edge of the head. This piece here that comes around, there are actually three spines coming off of that, and you've got two spots with hairs on them. That is the labrum. That's our upper lip. Then you have this fella here and that fella there. Those are your mandibles. And if we zoom down just a little bit, we can see right here this sclerotized piece that's also metallic green blue. So cool. Those are, that's one of the labial palps. Um, or it's one of the mouth palps. I believe it's labial. Let me check. I believe that that would be one of our labial palps. But you know where I can definitely know is there is a head, um, there is a really cool pic detailed picture of our head. So those ones that we're seeing that are really long here coming out from the end, those are actually our maxillary palps. Um, so those are going to be connected to the maxilla and, um, and right above the bottom jaw. 
So that's what those are. And they're used to grab on to, to help kind of push the goo and push their food into their mandibles. Their mouth fingers, they help do this. All right, I do want to zoom out just a little bit so we can see the head in, in its entirety um, because I admit I want to sketch it. I want to sketch the head head on. So we'll look at it this way and then um, and then we'll go ahead and sketch it both this way and then over here head on. So when we were looking at it from the front, all we, we could really see from in front of the eyes was a little bit of the edge of that head there where the um, where it connected to the labrum. So we're going to bring it up a little bit and then give you a little bit of a wavy line and that's the edge of our head. Now our, um, our labrum from the top looked a little bit like kind of this angled rectangle here. So I'm going to pull it out like this, but then instead of just making it straight across, now that we've seen it, we know that there are these three very kind of unique spines on the top of the upper jaw, and I want to make sure that they make it into our sketch. So I went ahead and added those three kind of spines here. Let's see if I can get my paper to look right. There we go. So we've got those taken care of up here. We could go ahead and sketch those two little spots on the upper, um, on the labrum. And then you've got your mandibles here. And those are some wicked mandibles. They have three, um, they have three sharp points on the inside. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and erase what I have in here because our mandibles are going to be a little more impressive than what I had. Um, they are gonna start, they do kind of connect back here to the head. So make sure that your labrum did not go all the way to the edges. Um, cause these are where your, your mandibles start. And then once it gets past the labrum, that's when it starts kind of curving back in towards the head. Um, we have one, two, three, and then make sure that it matches on the other side. Um, on this one, it's likely actually going to go past, so, but these are going to kind of meet in the center. And sometimes, um, sometimes the tips of tiger beetle mouths will actually um, cross and show at the, at, at the end of each other. But I think that that is actually pretty accurate for what it would um, look like, you know, if you're if its mouth was all the way up like this. You know, our friend here, his mouth is a little bit down, but that's fine. I think everything is good. So, um... Our antenna would be coming out from here. Um, we do have multiple pieces. Well, I wrote maxillary palps and we didn't sketch them. So we would have to sketch them here. Our mouth fingers. Um, these are multi-segmented and um, we can see there, there's a long segment here, and I believe you've got at least another two segments that come in this direction, but they are underneath the mandibles, so they're a little bit more difficult to see and imagine. So what we can do is just sketch them the way we see them. Put that one segment that comes out, and then one more that comes back in towards its mouth, and that's accurate to the insect and to the sketch, because we're not sure what the other, um, how many other segments you have. Um, and those, um, palps are underneath the, and underneath the mandibles. So it's not like we would see them from here anyway. All right. So we've got our mandibles, the labrum, the, uh, maxillary palps. We're going to be looking a little bit at these antenna, at least where the antenna connect into the head. You have the scape, the pedicel, and then the flagellum. 
And these are your three words for our antenna. So the scape is the first segment of the antenna, Terry will point it out. It's right about here. Um, then we have this next one that's a little bit shorter. This is the pedestal. And then the rest of the antenna segments together are considered the flagellum. So from... From about here, a lot of times when I first start sketching my antenna, I will just start sketch the scape and the pedestal, and then the flagellum, I will actually wait to sketch until after I have my legs sketched, because I like to draw the antenna at the end. Um, I think that it helps me with the length of the legs when the antenna aren't in the way. So let's see, we've got coming out from what'll look like underneath the eyes, we have the scape. And then a little bit shorter, we have the pedestal. And then the rest of them will be the flagellum. And I'm not going to add the other ones just yet. So we've got the scape on this side, and then a shorter pedestal, and then the rest of the flagellum. So they just kind of look like stalks coming off the top of the head, but I do have these kind of base antenna lines that I was going to be working off of. So that's convenient. If I was going to throw out a guess, I believe that this specimen is female. Um, I was told by, uh, someone who studies tiger beetles that, um, there's this tiger beetle that when they're males, their tibia have, um, the tibia on their front legs have a series of comb-like hairs, um, that they're used, uh, in the mating process, whereas, uh, the females don't have those hairs on the bottom of the front tibia. So when you're looking to determine male versus female on tiger beetles, you're going to look at their front legs. Um, the, mo the boys have hairy front legs and the girls do not, is the moral of that story. Um, now when I was talking to this entomologist, we were talking about one specific species. Um, so I'm not sure if that is all tiger beetles or if it was um, specific to that genus or species. But my guess would be that it is most tiger beetles because um, it seems like it was a pretty common feature. So we are looking again at our at the back, at the dorsal side of our tiger beetle. We're going to be focusing right here on the pronotum. All right, I'm hitting you guys with both iridescence and texture. Look at that. Wow. All right, I'm happy. <laughs> so that's going to be our pronotum. I, let's see, I'm going to erase this. Give myself a fresh, a fresh space. My tiger beetle did actually angle itself, so it's coming out like this. So my, uh, my whole body is going to be tilting a little bit. Uh, but that's fine. I'd rather tilt the rest of the body than, fix, than try and erase and fix the angles that right here. So, um, our pronotum starts here at the edge of our head. It comes out just a tiny bit, but it does come in like this. And then once it comes in towards the center, it comes down a little bit too before it connects to the elytra or to those front pair of wings. So that is going to be our overall, this is going to be our overall shape for our tiger beetle. And then when we're coming down here to connect the pronotum to the elytra, there is actually a pretty strong um, wave that comes up and back down at the center and up. 
So you've got this pretty strong wave here, but it might may not be as strong as that. Let's see. Let's try that one more time. That's better. So that's going to be our pronotal region or our pronotum. This is the first segment of the thorax. I'm going to give a little bit of a darkening. Let's see. Maybe like this. I'm going to shade it above here. Just give it a little bit of... Um, shape and then down here like this something like that all right so that's going to be our head and then our pronotal region um, when we're coming down from the pronotum, actually right here in this in this image, it's actually pretty easy to see what we call the scutellum. So let me change these words up here for us. If we're looking at the scutellum, it is right about... Oh, come on, Terry. Fly away. He says, no, I don't want to fly. Here we go. All right, that little triangle right here that's central and in between the elytra or in between the front pair of wings, that is what we call the scutellum. So, um, we're going to be, it's funny how my entire sketch is moving over like a, let's see, we can actually measure it now how far the center is from the, um, how far the center is from my old center. It's like a half a centimeter. It moved to the right. It's funny how sketches will do that sometimes, but it's um, also good to be able to move with your sketch rather than kind of fighting it. Sometimes I do that, and it doesn't work as well. So we're going to start here from the center of our pronotum, and we're just going to give it that tiniest little itty-bitty scutellum, all right? It's not huge, um, and when you look at it from far away, it's almost not even visible. Um, a Susan asked, oh, forgot to check on the head. Are there ocelli? No, tiger beetles do not have ocelli. Oh, I was wrong about it being an acutellum. It's more like an equilateral tellum. Oh, that's funny. And suggestions for the show? I could watch Sanctuary. Um, what's that about? Oh, bye, Chaos. It was nice to have you for a little while. So if there are others out there, I see there are a handful of you out there hanging out. Um, you can always feel free to share if you've ever seen a tiger beetle in your life. If you have, what region of the country are you in? Um, I've collected tiger beetles in New Mexico, in Arizona, in Oregon, in Pennsylvania. Um, I actually have a decent collection of tiger beetles. This specimen here came from New Jersey, actually on the same trail that um, I collected. Do you remember um, a little bit ago we sketched that black-headed... Um, um, the black-headed deer fly, uh, not deer fly, horse fly, the black-headed horse fly, um, I caught this tiger beetle at the same place I caught that horse fly. 
All right. Our elytra do have some pretty distinctive shoulders. So when they come out from the edge here, you're also going to have these rounded um, edges. These are our elytra. These are our um, wing shells. Let's see. We call them elytra. And only beetles have elytra. And our elytra are rounded all the way to the end, but then once we get to the end, at the very center, there's going to be just a little tip of the abdomen that shows at the very, very end. And our, the center of our elytra, and it looks like I should have drawn the center of the elytra before I drew the edge, the end of the abdomen. <laughs> It's always better to have, it's always better to have that center line first. There. So we've got that taken care of and now, um, I have these kind of our stick figure legs, and I'm surprisingly, I'm actually still kind of happy, at least with the right side of the legs. The left ones, I'm going to have to re-change just a little bit to make sure they stay even. So I'm going to base my spots off of where my right legs are. So if I go to this hind leg here, um, we've got the one spot that's kind of triangular. Um, somebody said regularly irregular. Um, they're not even, and they're not even to each other. They're more of a natural shaping. Um, and maybe that's why they mean by guttata. Instead of it being like an even spot, it's um, more of like a rain droplet or a paint droplet. Um, and actually, for me, I'm just now seeing that our tiger beetle isn't all the way rounded here. It's not really a smooth round. There are almost these little shoulders. So if we come down here, it's parallel until about the second spot and then it curves in. And so I had it more rounded and I wanna make sure that it's more like this where I have an edge here so that I know where I'm putting my second spot. Um, and maybe it's going to go just a little bit higher. Maybe it's going to go more like this. Nope, I liked it where it was. Yeah, something like that. And so then we have the second spot right around here. We have a third spot down here at the edge of our elytra. And then you've got an itty, itty, bitty, tiny one right about here. And those two itty, bitty, tiny ones in the center, they are very circular. They're very round. Um, just make sure that your um, regularly regular spots are approximately in the same place in every um, spot right here, 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 and a little, little guy there. And then you have your six spots on your six spotted tiger beetle. Now we've got the body very much taken care of. We've got the colorations on the elytra. We can even zoom in. Let's go ahead and zoom in on one of those spots just to see what they look like. Plus, I'm interested in what the um, what this would look like. How cool is that? So this is the um, texturing and the um, and the iridescence on the elytra. These elytra will never fade. They are you may have guessed this. They are a structural um, color, not a pigmented color. So these are all little itty bitty crystalline structures on the top of the exoskeleton, and it's the way that they reflect the light that makes them look green and blue. And yes. Susan, you are right. We are looking at punctations. That's a great word. Uh, 
That's not true. If you got two true bugs, you'd have Elytra. Oh, you're funny, Susan, because the true bugs have Hemi Elytra, so if you get two of them together, oh, you're funny. I love it. Um, you know, you probably could argue that with somebody. Hmm, I think that that's really pretty, though. We can actually go even further. I want to know if we... That's so cool. I feel like there are small kind of micro punctations or little kind of striey little lines inside of the, um, like around the punctations. They're very pretty. All right, let's look at legs. And we might as well start with the back legs, um, because I know that the back legs have all of their toes, first of all, and they're very easy to see, um, as pin specimens, and, um, we're already kind of focused here on the back end. Plus, the front legs have a couple of tarsi missing, and so, um, this will be better. Now, let me go ahead and look up... Um, tiger beetle tarsal formula, because I want to make sure we know exactly how many four, um, tarsal segments the front leg have. They are a five, 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 um, tarsal formula. So each one of their tarsi, their front, their middle, and their hind legs, they all have five tarsi. So if we are looking here, we can count one, two, three, four, four, five, and then the two little tarsal claws. Perfect. Um, we're going to zoom in. Let's go ahead and look at the leg on the right. More light. Give me more light. They say no. This is fine. We'll probably zoom in on the tarsal segments. So instead of trying to get the whole leg in focus, we're going to zoom in right here on the femur and the tibia, and then we will focus it back down when we're looking at the tarsal segments. That's what we'll do. Maybe. I want it to have more light. Let's go to the other side and see if we get more light on this side. Wow, look at that. Okay, we're going to go on the left. All right, this is what I wanted to show you. This is what our left leg is actually showing, that the legs are also metallic, so it's not just the body that's metallic. The legs are also this really, really pretty iridescent color. So our hind legs are coming out from around that top spot here, and they're coming up. So our legs in tiger beetles are very, very long, they're very, very thin, and they're adapted for running. So instead of having just kind of, um, instead of having just basic walking legs, um, a walking leg... A walking leg in insects is called an ambula, is an ambulatory leg, but our tiger beetles don't have just walking legs. They have running legs, and running legs are called cursorial because they can run really, really fast across the ground, and I imagine that they're kind of cursing across the ground. Um, I'm not sure what the root is that makes it that way, but that's our, that's our story. 
Yeah, it has a little bit of a chonky femur. It does have um, CD or little hairs coming off of the femur and off of the tibia. So my tibia is going to be coming down till about right about here. Uh, maybe even it's a little bit, it might be just a little bit shorter than this because the first tarsal segment is also pretty long. So I'm going to put my tibia to come right, till right about here. And our tibia does have a, um, it does have two tibial spurs. Um, we can only really see, we can only really see one tibial spur from this angle. Um, I promise there are two there. Let's go ahead and focus down. So there's the one um, tibial spur up there um, at the top, and then the other tibial spur is actually directly away from us. And then our tarsal segments <clears throat> our tarsal segments, if you get close enough to them and you give them enough light, you will notice that they are also metallic. Oh, look down here. You can see this one's pretty metallic right here. One, two, three, four, five tarsal segments, and then those two tarsal claws. And this is going to be the overall of every single one of the legs. It's going to have five tarsal segments and... um. All of those tarsal segments are long and thin. So let's see. This first one is kind of like this. One, two, three, four, five. And the tarsal claws. That got really close to the end of the paper, but we made it. So we've got our femur, our tibia, and our tarsal claws. Now um, we're going to be coming up here and we're going to be doing our middle legs. Admittedly, they're going to be very, very similar to our hind legs. So, all right, we'll move it. I was considering not moving the, the microscope because they're going to be the same, but I'll go ahead and move it for you just so that you can also see kind of where exactly on the elytra the middle legs um, come out. And you might want to see all of those, that plume of hair on the middle tarsi. That's kind of fun. Middle of the tibia. <clears throat> all right, so you've got two different options. This leg on the left is kind of coming up, and when it is coming up, it's actually coming up from up here at the shoulder. And then the other one that's coming down, when it comes down, it's coming down around here. And because I do want my legs to be going up, I'm actually going to be picking my leg up closer to here so that it is coming more out of the, um, the shoulder of the elytra. Um, when we're talking about the shoulders... I don't know if this is, I know that when you're talking about the shoulders of stink bugs, you call it the humeral angle, but I'm not sure if you call it the humeral angle when it's a beetle, because I think that's, that might be a word just for stink bugs. So we're just going to throw this word back up here, Sisandella sexcutata. And my leg is going to be coming up from here, up from the from my shoulder of my elytra. My cursorial leg. And then the tibia is going to be coming down, and it looks like it's going to be the length of right above this first spot. So when it comes down, it looks like it's going to come down 
about like here and then it has it also has two tibial spurs but you're only going to be able to see one because of where it is and then we've got those five tarsal segments and i'm going to have them coming out in this direction also keep in mind that they are going underneath the hind leg so let's see this would have been one coming out right about there one two three four five and the tarsal claws so right about like that we've got a middle leg and we've got a hind leg so we're going to be going up um keep in mind that now we are our front leg does not have all five tarsal segments unfortunately they lost a toe or two um or four it looks like but um We've seen these legs over and over when we saw the middle and the hind legs, so it's going to be generally the same idea. So our front legs are coming out of the front of our pronotum. So if we look where our head and our pronotum connect, our femur comes out right about here. Right about there. Our tibia is gonna be coming up. Haha. Ha. I made our I made my mandibles. I would got so excited about the mandibles that I um didn't make them how they would look from the top. I just wanted to show them off. Oh man. Alright, so our tibia is gonna come out to be about here actually, so Sometimes where your femur and your tibia touch, if you get the angle um, a little bit off, you can just go ahead and erase it and then just find that. Um, I can go ahead and show you here. If you make it... If you make it like this and you've got one kind of connecting to the other, that's not going to be as realistic as if you erased those lines in here, kind of found your angle, and then made the line like this, where they're meeting more like this at a 45 rather than cutting it off in it, at either of the actual angles. So you want them to kind of meet at an angle like that. All right, so then we've got, that's our tibia. Our tibia still have two tibial spurs, but you can only see one. And then we've got five tarsal segments. One, two, three, four. No, my spotted. Five. It is smaller. That's fine. Yay! All right, so we have a front leg, a middle leg, a hind leg. We've got eyes. Um, I actually am going to fix the overall shape of this compound eye. I want it to be a little bit higher up. I think that it was kind of, it almost looked like it was tired. It was um, kind of more angled down rather than angled up. So I wanted to fix that really quick. All right. Our legs all on the right side. And let's go ahead and sketch some antenna. So we've got the scape, the flagellum, oh, the scape, the pedestal, and then the numbers of flagellum. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine antennal segments on the flagellum. But if you count the scape and the pedestal, you have eleven. So you've got one, two, and then I'm going to take this line and I'm going to just make it lightly about how long I think my antenna are going to be. And then I'll be able to kind of divide that line into nine. So let's see. Our first one is pretty long, so one, and then two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. About like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yahoo! And I'm going to go in here and erase kind of where it goes over that leg because I want to make sure that the lines stay nice. And I know which one goes over which one when I come back with ink. Are those spines at the end of each tarsal segment too? I believe that the tarsal segments have seedy or little hairs. I wouldn't call those spines on the ends of the tarsal segments. I would call them hairs. Oh, check that out. Maybe there is one right here on the first tarsi. It looks like there's one spine here. So if you were also looking at a middle leg, there might have been more spines on a middle leg. Let's see. call those spines but they look more kind of yellow rather than sclerotized they don't look like the dark blue dark green color they more look like that lighter color so rather than calling them a spine I would probably call those bristles um it's uh it's probably a very diff it's probably kind of a difference the um, these look like they probably have a joint at the base of them so that they can kind of move like a hair would rather than a spine a lot of times is straight and isn't mobile so it's not turning or moving a lot I really need to take a close-up image of this um, of these elytra and I realized I have more dermestids in my collection than I thought so I'm gonna be going and I'm gonna be spending a lot of time tomorrow um, dermestid proofing some more of my containers somehow over the last couple of weeks I've got a couple of them in my in in my drawers I think I've just been admittedly leaving them out on my desk probably a little bit too long I need to get better into the hang of uh, getting my specimens back into the drawers after we use them. So, Susan, I hope I answered your question about the spines on the tarsal segments. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with the time that we spent on my friend the tiger beetle here. Um, I'm going to zoom out our specimen so that you can see the entire guy, kind of get him all focused from the top, just in case you want to get a little bit of the, the, the shading with the way the light's had hitting or whatever you need. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I want to get my left legs done on this guy because I'm feeling motivated to get these legs in and I think he'll look even cooler with both pairs of legs. And I already have many, many insects that only have half of their legs. So it'll be good to have one that, that is absolutely complete. aren't going to be exactly parallel with each other but as long as they are approximately the same length that's what matters my specimen might be walking a little bit <laughs> um i can see that i i do like the angle of my right leg just a little bit better but i think that these will both be 
fairly equivalent. Let's see, we've got this, and that's the end of our tibia, and then we've got the tibial spine, and then one, two, three, four, five. There we go, two legs there. Susan is going to try to ink this in a way that shows the iridescence without color. Ooh, good luck. That should be fun. Good, good luck. Does leaving the specimen there with, um, with its lighting and everything help you with, um, help you with inking them, it's inking the iridescence? Just getting this other pair of, um, just getting this other left set of legs taken care of before we end our live stream today. Um, we got to talk about all different types of the body parts of our tiger beetles. We got to look at them up close. Um, there weren't very many questions about his structure or body shape or color or anything like that. But we got to look at, my favorite part of looking at tiger beetles is looking at them head on. So that was kind of cool in the beginning. We got to check out its mandibles and we got to see, um, it's, we got to see what it looks like head on. I'm just going to erase this in Della. Now we do know, we know what it is and I want that space for my Tarsi. I think he's so cool. <sighs> and we got to talk about their grubs. And I believe they And I believe that they also pupate in these tubes that they make. And they have all of this extra space. They don't just have that end there because they have the ability to drop and make themselves look invisible. And, um, people will actually, people will use, like, a piece of a grass or a really, really thin worm or even, um, a little piece of fishing line, something like that. They'll put it all the way down their hole and they'll wait for the tiger beetle to bite on it and then they'll kind of fish for tiger beetle grubs and that's a lot of times how people collect them. You can do that or you can dig after them but keep in mind if this hole is two feet deep you might be digging two feet down to find a grub that's like a half an inch long and that's a lot of sand to sift through so you've got to have like if you're going to be digging after tiger beetles you have to have a significant size of a um of like a sand sifter so you can be just like putting large amounts of sand in a sifter and kind of sifting out the tiger beetle grubs so that's kind of like a larger scale collection or you can catch them individually with this thread kind of go ahead and fish Oh, good! I'm glad I explained everything well. I think that I, I, I really do love our tiger beetles, so 
That's fun. Um, Cisandella is the genus of our friend here, and um, is actually the first. Cisandella was the first genus of tiger beetles described. I'm not sure. I believe that yes, there are other species, other genera of tiger beetles out there, but Cisandella are the first ones, and I think they're also the largest group of tiger beetles. Um, and their whole subfamily is based off of their name. So Cisandella is the genus, and Cisandellini is the subfamily. Awesome sauce. All right. Okay. I think that we are pretty much done. Um, I've got my tiger beetle all sketched out. If you do need more time on the um, metallics and getting your ink in for your metallics, you can go ahead and pause it um, and, and pause me a little bit or um, finish the live stream and come back just a little bit if you'd like to go ahead and finish your metallics. Um, I'm going to be heading off. I hope that everyone had a wonderful day. It is October 9th, so this is this has been Invert-tober episode 9. Um, let me go ahead and find my closer. There we are. This has been Invert-tober episode 9. Um, I've been really enjoying live streaming every night with you. Um, it's uh it's a blast so thank you so much for um allowing me to live stream every single night and for you guys you're actually showing up chaos and susan i see you all the time and i super super appreciate the fact that you are both interactive and you chat with me and you keep these live streams interesting and exciting so i really really appreciate you um, on Monday, tomorrow, we are doing an animal meet and greet. Um, I will be bringing my Asian rainforest scorpion from my rearing room upstairs, and we're going to be talking about scorpions. We're also going to see my scorpion glow under ultraviolet light, so don't miss it. It's going to be a great Halloween-y episode, and we're also going to be talking about all of the body parts of a scorpion. So, um, I might even, uh, I might even do a little bit of reading and, um, bonus information about scorpions so that I can um, share with you something I learned yesterday too. I'm sure that there's all types of stuff about scorpions that I have yet to learn. So um, we're going to be talking about those on Monday and then Tuesday we are going to be doing um, Insect Tarot again. And Insect Tarot was so popular last week that I'm really excited to get into it again this week. We're going to be inclining um, another one of my suits in the tarot deck. I don't exactly remember which one it is, so I will have to go ahead and look it up. All right. Perfect. So, um, over there is our out school. Um, it's my reminder to say, hey, if you know a student ages 5 to 8 or 9 to 12 and they love bugs and they want to know more about insects or they want to meet other students who also love bugs, um, you can join me at out school. And I teach all types of students. We do scientific illustration, but we also do just a junior bug club and a weekly insect studies where we pick a different insect every week and we ask questions about it and we look at it under the microscope and we learn all about it. Now, um, so that's what Out School is all about. Um, this is my YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and you hit the notification bell. If you are new out there and you have really seriously enjoyed this, please hit the subscribe button. Go ahead and um, hit the bell if you want notifications as when I go live. I've been going live at 10 p.m. Eastern every night, um, except that I've been saying every night except Sundays, but today is Sunday and was at 10 because I was planning on going to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Festival. That has actually gotten pushed off to October 23rd um, because I didn't buy tickets in time. So um, I'm going to have to push the October 23rd episode also to 10 p.m., just a heads up. Um, but next week we'll be back to our normal time at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, so that's a little bit about our Sunday timing and the way it changes up a little bit. Um, 
That is my QR code that links directly to my PayPal account where you can donate a couple of dollars to me and to Insectopia. Um, I am planning on purchasing more insect pins and more unit trays shortly so that I can keep my um, collection updated and beautiful um, for you ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm also going to need to pick a day of the month that I'm doing an insect, like an entire collection show and tell. Um, what do you think about Friday, October 21st? Think on Friday, October 21st. So I can show you my uh, my entire collection. Um, we'll also probably pull some of the specimens off of my pinning boards, anything I have there. Um, I do have even more specimens that I need to pin. Susan says, sounds great to me. Perfect. I love it. So October 21st, that's going to be um, that Friday. We are going to look at my entire collection. We're going to go through drawer by drawer. I'll be able to talk to you a little bit about how I have them organized and why I have them organized in that way. Um, it's six drawers, so it's like there is a lot of space, but also um, when you keep in mind all of the ways that insects are divided, sometimes I'm like, I wish I had more space or my collection is going to be growing quickly. So I'm excited about that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Out School, YouTube, PayPal, super appreciated. All of the links are also in the description box. So if none of these things work, um, the description box is where you can find them. I am at Insectopia2015 on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram. You can find me there that way. Um, if you wanted to find me on TikTok, I think I only have one or two videos, and I'm actually at Insectopia because I grabbed it first. Yay! All right, so um, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night. I will see you tomorrow with a live scorpion. Um, stay buggy!